Can you hear me with that in the background? I know you can't answer. What? Um. I um I thought I'd come somewhere a bit quieter, but I forgot I came here last summer and uh, it wasn't particularly quiet then either. Not in the best mood, to be honest. Shut up! Uh, okay, so this video so far has been a bit of a car crash, to be honest. I didn't end up filming it in Wales because it got a bit rainy and windy and stuff. So I decided to come back to Manchester, filmed it yesterday in my living room. I thought it'd gone fine. I thought the third time had gone fine. The first two I couldn't really string sentences together, but the third time seemed all right. But then when I was editing it this morning, it became clear that it wasn't. And in some cases, I couldn't even string words together, let alone sentences. So this is basically just an acknowledgement that in parts, some of the jump cuts are ridiculous. And in total, there's probably about 150 of them. And uh, if I had time, I'd film it all again, but I don't. So hopefully we can just watch it together and laugh at how ridiculous it is that I can't say two or three words without a jump cut at times. Um, and hopefully it's not too annoying. Here's the video. Hello everybody. Um, those of you who've watched this channel for a little while will know that quite often I start videos outside and finish them inside. Usually because I've had to because I've made some sort of glaring error in my filming process. You know, not turning the, the microphone on, not turning the camera on. Mm. Uh, in this case, I didn't actually do anything wrong. It just started raining. And even though the majority of my gear is weatherproof, my microphone isn't and uh, on a windy day you need your microphone so if anyone knows of any weatherproof microphones if you could let me know that'd be great anyway let's crack on shall we this video is all about filters and whether or not you need filters and i think in most cases maybe not most cases but a lot of cases there definitely is a case for for having filters i mean you can get filters cases but there's also you know what i mean uh, now all of these filters that you see here that I'm going to talk through today, these have been supplied to me by a company called GoBee. Long story short, about this time last year? This time. Yes, this time last year when I started using the G85 for filming predominantly but also as a secondary stills camera, um, I bought some GoBee filters. I bought like a, a polarizer and a couple of ND filters and I've been so impressed with them that I reached out to them. They very kindly agreed to send me a load of new filters now that I've changed exclusively to Micro Four Thirds. So for both stills and video, from now on, I'm gonna be using Micro Four Thirds and I'm gonna be using these filters on the lenses that I've bought. So I should say that I haven't bought any of these filters. They were sent to me for free. Uh, but this isn't any kind of sponsored video. It's not an advert. Gobi haven't paid me to say anything particular. Um, I just happen to use Gobi products because I think they're, they're incredible. Uh, and very kindly, they sent me some filters for my new gear. What I would say though, is if you're in the market for filters, by all means check out Gobi because they're easily accessible. They're on Amazon. They're very good quality. They're very affordable. And every time you buy a product from them, they plant five trees which is awesome. So yeah, the kits that I use are in the description below if you're interested. Uh, now as far as I'm concerned, there are four main kinds of filters and I use three of them and I, I, I don't use one of them. So I'll go through the ones that I do use and then also the, the kind that I don't. And um, yeah, hopefully that will be useful in some way to you and your photography. I've just realized that this is probably really bad for Moire. Be fine, just don't look at it. We'll carry on. Okay, so first up is polarizers. Now I would say that for most photographers, uh, polarizers are by far the most important kind of filter. And the reason for that is that it's very difficult to replicate what a polarizer can achieve in post-production. Now last summer I made a video about polarizers, you can check it out here. But basically what this can do if it's pointed in the right direction in relation to the sun, is it can make skies bluer and greens greener, but it can also remove glare and reflection from water or wet rocks and stuff. And uh, as I say, it's very, very difficult to replicate that in post. So I think a polarizer is, uh, is pretty much a necessity for any kind of photographer who uh, does landscape or any kind of outdoor photography. One notable point, it does reduce the light that hits your lens by about two stops. So uh, if you're working in low light, they're not always ideal unless you've got a tripod and uh, you haven't got any moving objects in your frame, unless you want moving objects in your frame. But yeah, polarizer, very difficult to achieve what this can achieve in post and therefore it's pretty much a necessity to have in your bag. I think. Okay, next, this is a UV filter, and as you can probably see through my uh, through my shirt, 
it's pretty much just clear. I mean, compare it to the polarizer, which makes things a bit darker and reduces light by two stops, as I said. The UV filter doesn't, it's, it's just pretty much clear. Now, these were most commonly used uh, back in the days where film was, was being heavily used because film was sometimes affected by UV rays. It would cause all sorts of weird color casts. Um, I haven't used film a lot, I've just read this. Nowadays though, and I know this to be a fact, these are used primarily for protection on lenses. So you imagine the front element of your lens, you don't really want to hit in a rock or anything like that. So you'd maybe put one of these on top of your lens. It basically acts as a barrier so that if you do smash against something, it's not your lens that takes the brunt, it's this. The problem with that though, is that because these are used primarily as protection now, people tend to go cheap on them. And I would suggest that that is a mistake because ultimately this is something that's going in front of your lens and you're paying an awful lot of money for your lens, probably at least in comparison to this. And anything that you put in front of your lens can potentially reduce the quality of your image. So you want to make sure that if you're going to use one of these for protection, um, it's, it's got to be a good quality one because otherwise you're just reducing the quality of your image and if you bought an expensive lens and you're trying to protect it, you might as well have bought a less expensive lens because you might end up with the same image quality if you end up using cheap UV filters. So yeah, if you're going to use one for uh, protection, then make sure it's a decent one. Okay, next up, ND filters. Now these are a little bit different to polarizers and UV filters because these block all kinds of light, not just polarizing or UV light. Now the primary reason for using one of these is to slow down your shutter speed and there are a number of occasions where you might want to do that. Uh, here, for example, is a fast prime lens. This is f 1.7 and typically I really like shooting with this you can get quite a nice shallow depth of field even though it's micro four thirds uh, the problem though is if you want to shoot wide open with it in the middle of the day then quite often on certain kinds of cameras you can't get a fast enough shutter speed to only let in enough light to get a well exposed image quite often you end up with an overexposed image because the camera can't open and close the shutter fast enough now when that's the case you can just use an ND filter just screw this on here and in this instance, this is an ND1000, which means that it'll only let in a 1000th of the light that the lens would be susceptible to um, without the ND filter on. So I've got these in a number of different strengths. Here's an ND64, so it only lets in a 64th 64th of the light and so on and so on. Now these aren't only useful for really bright lenses um, They're also useful for if you want to say um, slow waterfalls down and get really flowing um, What's the word? Blurry water. So for example, if you're stood next to like a, a waterfall and you're getting a, an exposure reading of say a 50th of a second, then you're probably not gonna have really super blurry water. Uh, if you put one of these on like an ND1000, then you'll end up with a a, a much longer shutter speed, probably like five or 10 seconds or something. And uh, what that means is you end up with a photo like this. The other good use for ND filters is for video, actually. So people suggest, and I, I haven't known this for long, to be honest, I, I still know pretty much nothing about filming video, but basically the shutter speed you should be shooting at is double your frame rate. So if you're shooting at 25 frames per second, you should be shooting at a 50th of a second. And if you're struggling to achieve that because you're in broad daylight and you ended up with a thousandth of a second, then that's gonna lead to really choppy looking footage, unless you put an ND filter on, which should help you get back down to something like um, to something like a 50th of a second. And that basically covers the kinds of filters that I use. As I say, if you want more information, links in the, the description. Uh, now there is probably what you'd consider one glaring omission from the filters that I use, considering that I'm a, an outdoorsy kind of photographer, and that is graduated filters. Now, if you don't know what graduated filters are, basically it'll be filtered or dark at the top and then gradually towards the bottom, there'll be, there'll be no filter there, it'll just be clear. It'll look like a UV filter at the bottom. Uh, and the point of those is that you can expose well for an entire scene, an outdoor scene with high contrast, um, all in camera, all in one shot. So you might have a really bright sky and a much darker foreground or, or lower half of the image. And you can expose well for both using a graduated filter in just one shot. Now, I don't use those. And the reason for that is that I prefer to do that basically in post-production. So rather than using a graduated filter, I'll bracket for lots of different exposures, normally five or seven exposures in, in a shot I really like. Uh, and when I get back to my computer, I blend those exposures together. And I like doing that because I have a bit more control, I feel, than using graduated filters. A lot of photographers much, much prefer to do it all in camera. I think they feel it's a, a purer form of the process. I can, I can completely understand that point of view. And I definitely get that a lot of photographers want to do as much as they possibly can in camera. 
Um, I don't necessarily feel that urge, so I just prefer to work work in Photoshop and Lightroom more when I get back and, and just deal with multiple exposures. So that's the reason I don't use graduated filters. Graduated filters themselves come in lots of different uh, grads, so you can get soft grads or hard grads, loads of different kinds. Um, I'm not an expert on them really because I've not used them all that much. Lots of people do like to use them, so if you're a, an outdoors or a landscape photographer and you like to do as much as you possibly can in camera, then there's a good chance that graduated filters are for you. So the other thing that I've not really covered yet is, uh, well, I don't really know what you'd call it, Mount, mounting system. As you can see, these filters screw onto the lens, like so. Around the rim of each lens is what we call a filter thread. These come in lots of different sizes, depending on the size of the lens. And the filters just screw into them, like so. Uh, now there's one other kind of filters, a very popular other kind of filters, and they are called square filters. And there are several advantages to square filters, primarily that you don't need different filters for your different size filter threads because they just sit in front of the lens rather than screwing into it. Also, if you're stacking multiple filters on top of each other, so if you've got a polarizer and then like a neutral density and then a soft grad or whatever it might be, uh, then you're less likely to encounter vignetting. And in some cases, they can be slightly better quality as well. Now I would suggest that if you're the kind of photographer who surveys an area for a little while uh, before setting up a tripod and then just wants to get one shot in a particular location and, and really, really spends a lot of time on that one shot, then square filters might be for you because it takes a little bit more time to set up and, and modulate and stuff. If you're the kind of photographer who, like me, you just like to walk around with your camera getting lots of different shots in broadly the same kind of light um, and in, in the same kind of area, then screwing filters might work best for you because you just stick them on the front of your camera and then you can leave them there for the next half an hour while you're shooting hundreds of different shots and they're not going to fall off or fall out when you change orientation and all that kind of thing. So I much prefer screwing filters, but I know a lot of people also who prefer square filters. Anyway, that's it for filters. I think in future videos you'll probably see me using these a lot more and I can talk through in more detail why and when I'm using them. But um, as I say, if you're looking into any filters, start with the polarizer. Definitely start with the polarizer. Then you can build up from there, either with uh, screwing filters or square filters. I got there in the end. Hope that was useful. Thanks for watching. And, uh, and these, and these, and primarily, and what these do, and the, and the primary advantage and reason for using one of these, now the primary advantage and... Mm.